Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. In letter 33, Seneca is responding to his interlocutor Lucilius, who is asking him for a list or at least a few maxims, some sayings that are nice and short, as we say short and sweet, that's right there, a maxim, uh, when we use it uh, to describe something. And these are supposed to take the place of, you know, thinking deeply about things. They're sort of like what we call sound bites now. Or if you've ever seen these little memes where they'll have a passage, hopefully from the person who they attribute it to, and then usually a picture of somebody, sometimes they actually get that wrong too. They put somebody uh, who isn't Marcus Aurelius, but kind of looks like him in the place. People are constantly mixing up Epictetus and Epicurus and putting Epicurus as bust. And then there'll be like a little passage from their works, right? Um, these are very popular and they were incredibly popular in ancient times as well. So it wasn't all that unusual to ask for these sorts of things. Um, you can think all the way back to, for example, the uh, maxims at, at Delphi, these gnomic maxims. Um, there's other things that get brought up constantly. If you look in Plato's dialogues, people are constantly quoting this little uh, couplet from Simonides, the poet, or from Homer or Hesiod or whoever. So it's not that unusual to request this sort of thing. And as a matter of fact, um, Lucilius himself appears to have been a follower of Epicurus. And we know that the Epicureans circulated around these maxims of Epicurus that were sort of summarizing his doctrine. How do we know that? Because that's one of the few things we still have by Epicurus. So Seneca is being asked for this and he says, that's a terrible idea. You don't need that. Um, we'll, we'll talk about exactly you know, why he gives two main arguments for why it's not a good thing to be focused on maxims. But first he's going to um, you know, say, um, you, you want something more, don't you? And if we go deep into it, we can see that one of the criticisms that he has is that these are in some respects superficial. Um, about midway through, he says, if you insist, I'm not going to be stingy with you. I'll deal them out by the fistful. There's piles of them lying around. One only has to pick them up. There's no need to collect them. They come out not by dribs and drabs, but in a steady flow, all interconnected. That's going to be one of the ideas that's going to furnish the cr criticism that he's going to give. They're all interconnected. So he says, I'm sure these do a great deal. Um, they, they give a lot, magna, to raw beginners, rudibus, and listeners from outside of the school, extrinsecus auscultantibus, right, in the Latin. Um, so he's saying these are useful for a certain kind of person. They're useful for people who are interested in Stoicism, but are at this point outside of the school. They're not actually studying it in any um, coherent way or well-informed way. They're also good for raw beginners because it gives them something to start with. But what's the implication here? This isn't good for anybody who's actually going to make any progress. So a tool that can be quite useful at the beginning if one sticks with it and says, okay, now I understand what stoicism is. I've got these little quotes that I can pop out or I've got them on my phone, you know, from some app. That's not really stoicism. That's sort of being outside or being at the total beginner level. And you're not going to see the benefits of stoicism from just memorizing a bunch of quotes that you trot out from time to time. 
He says that these are like the Proverbs, the sententias, given to children. And the Greeks had a word for these, chreas, right? Um, these are things that, that you could have like ready to hand and you give them to kids because kids are actually not smart enough, at least at that point, to put everything together. He says that um, uh, they are what a child's mind is able to encompass, not yet having room for anything larger. So, you know, this is a bit of a problem if this is what grown adults are going to take stoicism to be because stoicism is much more than that so he's he's got a little bit of criticism here he says it's shameful when a, a man who's making definite progress seizes on flowery bits or props himself up with a handful of commonplaces he has memorized um, at a certain point you should be leaving these things behind or at least they should be contextualized so this leads us into the second thing and this is a little bit earlier in the letter. Um, one big issue here is that Stoicism is not a collection of maxims or sound bites. It is in fact a um, complex entire system of, of thought that was well worked out over time. Um, we have lost a number of the ancient Stoic texts, but they were available to Seneca. So he actually has a better view on that than we do, where he's actually one of the contributors to it. He's, he's the one who's helped pass this on. Um, but in his time, he's saying, listen, uh, you've got all these different writers, Zeno, Chrysippus, you know, uh, Posidonius he brings up, all sorts of others, Cleanthes. Um, you, you can read these texts, they are available to you, and you don't have to be just working off of little tiny passages. So one reason why he says that it's, in some respect, kind of silly and also hard to pick out maxims is that within the Stoic texts, the writings evenly contain important passages. There's nothing in there that's just for, you know, extra show or something like that. So he begins at the start by saying, um, Stoics did not busy themselves with flowery bits of speech. What is noteworthy, where what is noteworthy stands out from the rest, you can be sure the quality is uneven. So the very fact that there aren't any things that stand out as being above, as being unequal, is a sign that the whole is of a, uh, consistent quality and importance. So he goes on and he says, um, here we go. Uh, um, you know, we have a number of resources, all equally fine. We cannot separate out just one, even if we try. Wherever you cast your eyes, you will read something that could have been outstanding. Here's the if, if the remainder were not equally good. Um, so he's saying, I mean, you could read, he's not reading Epictetus, of course, but we have access to that. You could read Epictetus and you could go through there and like every single sentence could be a maxim if you want it to be, because they're all equally good. He's implying that this is probably the case for his own work as well. So why are you picking this passage instead of this passage and focusing on that? They're all balanced by others that are equally good. So there's a consistent level of quality. Then he stresses another thing about reading. And this is what takes us away from being beginners or being people outside of the system who don't really understand it, except through little, you know, short passages that are not totally representative. He says that, um, the subject matter is treated along the lines that are proper to it, and an intellectual product is devised from, with, from which nothing can be removed without a collapse, right? It says, when you're reading works of great people, you must read them as wholes. Come to grips with them as wholes. Tota is the word that he's using there. The totality of it. You need to... Um, grapple with them is another way to say it. Instead of just, you know, uh, trying to find yourself a, a, you know, best hits list or, uh, you know, one of these books that's got a few, you know, passages here and there all put together, you don't really want that. You want to read the actual texts and understand them and understand the mind of the author so that then you can, you know, fully grasp what the philosophy 
entails. And, and this is something that you can apply not just to Stoicism, but to philosophy in general. Even aphoristic philosophers like Nietzsche, you don't understand Nietzsche if all you do is say to yourself over and over again, what doesn't kill me makes me stronger. I mean, that's even out of context because Nietzsche says, the military mind, that which does not kill me, makes me stronger. He's not saying this is a, a you know maxim that holds for everybody or anything like that, right? Um, so we need context. We need things to be, the context means to be woven together, textum in Latin, right? Um, and so if you don't read the thing where all these passages are indeed woven together in a whole, you're missing out on a lot of what even the isolated passage itself means. So that's, that's one big argument that he's making. Another quite interesting one is that Stoicism is a lived and practiced philosophy. He says, you know, that we have all these great thinkers. Um, you know, who should we attribute our, our, you know, little texts to? To Zeno, to Cleanthes, to Chrysippus, to Posidonius, to, Pen to, Mate, to Penetius? We are not under a monarch. Each of us asserts his own freedom, right? And a little bit later, after he's talked about, isn't it kind of shameful to be like constantly quoting people and not really have any thoughts of your own? He says, um, uh, let this person stand on his own feet. Let him say these things for himself, not recall what he's memorized. For shame that an old person or one nearly old should get his wisdom from a textbook. This is what Zeno said. What do you actually say? Cleanthe said this. Well, what do you say? How long will you march under another's command? Take charge, say something memorable on your own account, bring forth something from your own store. So this is kind of a, a measure of whether you're actually understanding Stoicism, that you don't just remain with all these, you know, little isolated sayings, but that you actually produce your own work. And it might not necessarily be writing or speaking. It might just be how you actually live it out. But you're not going to be living it out just according to a code book with a bunch of, you know, short sayings. Um, and, and that would include Epictetus's Enchiridion, written much later, of course, than Seneca. But um, that would not be enough to, to go on. So Stoicism means that we should also be, as, as Seneca says, authors through action, coming up with our own ways of understanding these things. So he says, I feel all those people who are never authors, but always interpreters, concealing themselves in the shadow of another have nothing noble in them. They've never dared to put into action what they've been so long in, in learning. They've trained their memories on other people's words. But remembering is one thing. Knowing is another. Remembering is keeping track of something that you committed, he says, to, to memory. Knowing is making those things your own, not having to depend on a model or keep looking to your teacher for instructions. That doesn't mean that you're going to like make it all up as you go along. Obviously, it is still interpretation, but it's interpretation that is creative and productive and that is also faithful to the teachings by bringing them into new contexts. So this is what Seneca has to tell his friend. He's happy to give him maxims, but he doesn't want him to rely on them. I think this is advice that is just as relevant in the present about Stoicism and so many other philosophies as it was in Seneca's time, particularly in our internet age, where people love having short passages and thinking that thereby they understand a philosophy.